Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone. Today I had Brother Ridwan but and he was an amazing guest. And it was such an enlightening conversation where we talked about so many different things. We talked about the creation of the local masjid and staying true to your morals and values and beliefs. I asked him so many questions about patience, sabr, and how to stay constant in becoming a Muslim and really falling in love with the deen and falling in love with Islam. I even asked him a bunch of new questions as what would someone do if they were a new Muslim? And we even ended up talking about universal basic income, which is pretty awesome for me because, again, I always champion the idea and love the idea. So be tuned, stay ready. Here it is. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Brother Ridwan, what are you passionate about? I would be remiss if I did not honor my lineage and say that I'm passionate about food. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because, um, you know, the Butt family, mm -hmm. that's uh, my background, uh, are known for being foodies. Mm -hmm. So I would start by saying, yeah, food is something that I'm, I'm most passionate about um, in the, the things that I'm willing to share with yeah. others. And that's everything from um, enjoying good food, uh, sometimes even dabbling in cooking some things as well, um, and also living vicariously, watching other people enjoy food as, as well. Mm -hmm. No, I love <laughs> so, that. Yeah. What types of cuisine is like your favorite to cook or mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite types of cuisine that you like to eat yourself? Oh, that's a good question. That's a tough one. Um, so eating, I'm... Um, careful about what I eat. I don't have an adventurous palate where I go out and try every single thing. Yeah. Um, but in terms of uh, preparing, I, I think there's a line. There's the pre-COVID and post-COVID <laughs> palate that I have. Right? <laughs> yeah. So pre-COVID, it was different things. I used to spend time creating fusion dishes with my Asian background and some other, uh, I guess, uh, backgrounds as well. Bring them together, French cream sauces and, yeah. and Asian spices. Uh, but then during COVID, uh, it was about, okay, what can I do with the things that I have at home? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I got into baking some exotic breads, and also learning how to uh, make steak the proper way, quote unquote. <laughs> yeah, like not super well done or super yeah, rare, just because that our, sweet spot. Yeah, because our cultural way is uh, the meat has to be fully dead. Right? Yeah, <laughs> no pink, nothing has to be dead. Mm -hmm. And um, then I learned to enjoy good cuts of meat and preparing it so that uh, you know you can still see some life in it. Yeah, <laughs> and enjoy the taste of the meat. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, yeah, it's funny because I was just talking to my dad about that because he was like, he's like, Ali, do you, we like it a certain way. You guys like it your own way, right? <laughs> but I remember growing up and thinking like, well, well, like it's like it doesn't have to be like like a rubber tire. It could be like a little less cooked. Like and even like the red, it's like just the hemoglobin leaving the meat. It's like it's not like it's actually blood. Right. And he was like trying to explain that to him. And he was like, yeah, but this is just how I've always liked it. So this is how we'll eat it. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's cool, but. It is enough. It's something different when, like, it's that like sweet in the middle speed. At least for me, like that middle part where it's like soft and tender, but also still has the flavor. It's like my favorite. Yeah, so. and there's a reason behind that because the context of the people who have come here from other places is that um, meat that is rare or medium rare is not usually safe to eat. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you make it safe by overcooking it and making sure that any pathogen or any anything that's causing disease will be eliminated. Yeah. So that's just, a, again, people have become comfortable with that and are not, not used to transitioning to saying, okay, we have better quality meat um, uh, these days mm -hmm. and uh, don't have to worry about some of those things that we did back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people can't get over that hump. Yeah. <laughs> what other um, foods, like you're saying that you also have like, did made different types of breads. Like, what kind of breads were you kind of getting into? Oh, yeah, my favorite was uh, creating like a Turkish type of bread, mm -hmm. and and that's mainly because uh, of how delicious they are, but also how easy they are to make as well. Mm -hmm. So I spent a little bit of time just you know going through YouTube trying to figure out how I was going to occupy my time <laughs> sitting at home. Yeah, and that was one of the things: breads, rolls, and um, I have to say, since then I've been falling short over the past couple of years. I did switch over to to burgers as well, trying to make some good mm -hmm. burgers. And and this may seem quite passe to most people, but mm -hmm. for people from our background and culture who are used to curries and stews and, and biryanis and those kinds of dishes, uh, a simple burger that's well made is, um, is something that, you know, it's a joy to behold for, for some of us. <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah. It's funny because um, even for me, like I remember making like a cheesecake, but like a healthy version of a cheesecake and I'm in the kitchen, like I'm baking something or I'm trying to make a pizza myself and do these different things because... Even though, yeah, like I know how to make maybe like an Egyptian dish, like you're saying, it's a lot of stews and a lot of different things where it's like okra and you put it in with red sauce and then you put a little bit of like a lamb meat or beef chunks in it. And it's obviously it's such a comfort food, but then it's also what else can I also make or what could I also learn? Just not just my Egyptian culture, but other foods that I might also enjoy. Like who doesn't like a pizza, you know? Right, so, right. But I have to call you out there. I mean, a healthy version of cheesecake is not cheesecake. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking you'd be, about. <laughs> you'd be surprised. Like it was because, again, for me, like I don't have the biggest sweet tooth. 
but I'd know when something is like creamy or not. But like the only thing that makes it healthier is like using like light cream cheese instead of like the heavy cream cheese, right? But then also using I think the cottage cheese in it as well, which kind of gives it a little more protein, a little more right. like the same creamy consistency. Yeah. And like some uh, sometimes I'll still use like the graham cracker crust, mm -hmm. but sometimes I won't put the graham cracker crust at all. It'll kind of bake as is, and it's different, but it's still has that it kicks the, it hits the spot. Yeah. You know, if you are craving it, but a uh, original cheesecake, like yeah. all full fat, everything, nothing yeah. beats that. No more right? power to you, but just don't call it cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> Especially to a foodie, right? Yeah. But no, that's awesome. And what other things have you kind of felt passionate about other than food? And does food kind of bring into like your other passions or is it kind of like that core piece? Uh, food is a core value. Like I said, it's my part of my blood. Mm -hmm. um, then other than that, it's uh, passions that I've developed over time. And one of the biggest ones, and it ties into other things that I'm interested in, is um, just being part of a community and helping establish that and, and building a community out. I think that's been um, a journey for me personally, uh, as well as in terms of the results and what we're seeing. And, um, you know, so that's been another area that I'm very passionate about. That's awesome. And in the spirit of Ramadan and talking about food, obviously, mm -hmm. what are sort of some things that you do for like, obviously, like, Sahur versus like dinner and like how do you manage your balance like having a, a healthy diet in Ramadan because like the hardest thing in Ramadan is we think oh we're gonna lose weight or we're gonna this but then in the in the evening time everyone's making desserts or this it's so it's like a celebratory thing to have Ramadan so people will tend not to eat the best sometimes mm -hmm. so we'll how, do you do anything different in Ramadan than usual or how do you kind of manage yeah. that? I think you need to go back to the beginning of this talk. You're talking <laughs> to a foodie here. Right? So, <laughs> so healthy choice. No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, no, I have over the years started to make a concerted effort in how to approach Ramadan and how to benefit it from it in, in multiple ways, right? The fasting, the spiritual side is really important, but so is the the mental side of it as well. And just the fortitude you get out of it, the patience you get out of it, uh, those kinds of intrinsic benefits. And then lifestyle, right? How do you use it as a springboard to improving your lifestyle? So how I approach it these days, uh, especially the past few years, is I try to have a very light breakfast in the morning, which is, again, I should, if anyone from my lineage hears this, they'll be like, well, that's a travesty. How could you do that, right? Because <laughs> they're used to like all kinds of fried foods and heavy things and whatever you need to sustain you throughout the day. And what I learned um, over the years is that actually is counterproductive. It doesn't really help you. It actually goes against you when you, when you do that. And so I've tried to keep things as light as possible in the morning and, and then use uh, whatever mental strength I've been given with to remind myself that the hunger that I'm feeling, the thirst that I'm feeling, um, is not going to harm me. Mm -hmm. And to remind myself that I'll get through it and I'll be better for it as well. So that's helped me overcome some of those um, challenges with the transition from the heavy uh, breakfast to a lighter one. And then for suhoor, you know, we've tried really hard to um, start light as well, as opposed to, again, our culture says, have a table spread with everything and then just go crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Just enjoy Whereas um, the proper etiquette for breaking a fast is to give your body a break after having given it a break from eating and drinking all day long, mm -hmm. which is don't overwhelm it and you know, assault the system with all kinds of things. So um, soup, dates, those kinds of things just to start off with and then more stuff later on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, like you said, it really is about uh, choices and decisions that you make. If somebody wants to lose weight and get healthier, Ramadan is the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to, what you'll realize, and we've been checking, I, mean, I check my weight regularly uh, mm -hmm. throughout the, the month, um, it doesn't change much. Mm -hmm. right? You end up getting the calorie intake that you had outside the month if, yeah. if you don't care for those lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make the changes, then yes, you can see that needle moving day by day by day. And you'll see the results that, that you're seeking if you if you use it that way. Yeah, I've kind of noticed that as well for me because obviously, like I like I said, I check my weight on the scale at least <laughs> once a day. Sometimes I'll just see it and I'll let me see where I'm at right now. Right. Especially if after I work out, I'm like, okay, this is how much I sweat, like this is how much water I need to replenish as well. It's something I learned like by playing soccer in college and stuff is like they always said that after a session, like weigh yourself before and after, see how much water weight you're losing because you obviously didn't eat or anything or go to the bathroom or anything. So what water weight did you lose in the sweat? So then make sure you replenish that back so that your body can kind of be at its peak and not get cramps and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of do that naturally. But then I will look at myself like say if I'm starting the day at say 175, 178. Then I notice I'm at 172 after all this workout, sweating for three at four mile run, lifting, gym, all these things. I'm like, wow, like that means six pounds of like either water weight or stuff 
was out of just sweat your body but then does that mean i can now go eat six pounds of food it's like it's you know I mean? that's not how it works not so that simple so it's you have to like understand like how, what your body is and there's something called like intuitive eating where it's like you're not like counting calories but you're just kind of trusting yourself as okay this is good to eat um and i'm full like you know mm-hmm. two pieces of chicken breast and a little bit of salad and a little bit of rice and i'm full oh, i can't eat anymore but then it's that's it and then you don't really get hungry because you ate satiating, satiating foods rather mm-hmm. than a bunch of little snacks like you're saying in our culture it's like some boosted like samosas right. and the fried foods and it's like you can eat like 20 of those and kind of be like what's next yep. all right so I oh, get that. that's that's so true and part of it is um how spirituality and our, our faith as you know is not just about the spirituality so it's a way of life mm-hmm. and if we incorporate that and i've been trying to and it's hard it's very hard to do it especially when you're transitioning from that enjoy life and enjoy all these things to be more disciplined and careful about what you do uh, you look at the intersection and where the guidance for us is Eat until your stomach is one-third full, mm-hmm. right, with solid food. And drink until your stomach is one-third full. So one-third for food, one-third for, for liquid. Mm-hmm. And the rest of it, let it, your stomach just you know, have that space for itself to mm-hmm. process the other two-thirds, mm-hmm. right? And um, it's hard to do because so it, it requires resistance, it requires patience. But ultimately, that is the benefit. And if we do that, then our, our systems function as a well-oiled machine and keep you know, taking care of us throughout the day. Otherwise, we overwhelm them and assault our systems, and that makes it more complicated. So it's really about mixing the philosophical side of things, the spiritual side of things, and the physical, and bringing that all together and uh, you know, improving ourselves day by day. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And it's cool because even for me, like I obviously have read the like, hadith and stuff. Like, that's what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to do. And... I've tried. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> then I'm sitting there like, okay, let me at least drink a lot of water first so that when I eat, then I won't be as full or won't need to eat as much. Mm-hmm. And it's so weird because then I'm like, oh, but I'm still so hungry. Like, I, I want to eat more. And it's like, but again, it's like that temptation versus desire versus like, again, like that spiritual balance of focus on yourself, not overindulging or overconsuming. Because again, we can all sit there and be gluttonous and eat and eat and eat because we have this accessibility. But you have to maintain that consciousness of, but your body needs to, like you said, in a well-oiled machine, mm-hmm. right? So you can't function at the highest level of your body or feel the healthiest or even feel like strong or energized if you eat this big meal. Because what happens after I eat a big meal? I don't want to do right. anything. Right. I want to sit down, open something, watch something, hang out with my brother or sister, family, just sit and talk and do nothing. Mm-hmm. But when you kind of don't eat too much and stuff, you, you kind of feel like, oh, I can sit down and get some work done. And you're not really like, you're not hungry, but you're not really feeling this feeling of like lethargicness from the food, right? Because right. like the itis, right? They say yeah. like, you're the food baby. When like, yeah. oh, after the Thanksgiving meal, right? When people have it, they're sitting back, they can't do anything, right? right. Food comas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. No, alhamdulillah. And it's cool because you kind of tied in how Islam kind of ties into even your food life. So what other things in Islam kind of tie in that maybe some people might not realize tie into your day-to-day life wow actually the question should be the opposite like what doesn't tie into your day into the life i think that's the the beauty of of this faith is that every aspect of life has a connection in one way or the other to to faith Uh, even things like uh, you know the the basics like the prayer Mm -hmm. and that in for us is a conditioning in multiple levels Right, that it's a conditioning for us to stop whatever we're doing, whatever we've prioritized, and to spend a few minutes to remember how we got there and what our purpose is. The actions within the prayer themselves have a symbolism behind them as well. The fact that we're willing to bow down, and we're not allowed to bow down to anybody except our, our Lord and Creator. Mm-hmm. And we prostrate on the ground. And that has not just the spiritual implications, as I keep saying, but also the physical as well. Right, The fact that we're... Uh, having our blood flow into our heads, uh, and that's the only position in, in worship that um, you know our heart is above our brains, mm-hmm. and we're stimulating our bodies. Our blood is flowing into our, our heads, stimulating and focusing on um, you know self improvement uh, physically and physiologically as well. So all of these um, different things that we do or we practice uh, have some relationship in, in one way or the other to betterment uh, overall, right? mm-hmm. physical or personal or whatever else it is. Yeah, I remember, so I remember seeing uh, like a yoga instructor was talking mm-hmm. about like the prayer movements because mm-hmm. the yoga instructor was saying like, oh, being a yoga instructor for so many years, I've learned that even these positions, like there were some of the best positions to like stretch out your body. 
even just as a physical realm, right? So it's stretching out your body. And they were saying, like, putting your head to the ground that way, even, like you said, like the harping above the head, like the blood flowing, the rushing, helps alleviate pressure on the back and on the spine. And even when we go in sesta versus all these different things, you're like, wait, so there's almost like a beauty behind even the movements that Allah basically taught, how, taught us how to pray and saying this is how one of you, Allah wants to be worshipped. Right. But literally we know it's not only good for us spiritually to worship with creator but also physically our bodies so like you said how everything ties in so sweet yeah no, absolutely and if you think about this from the bigger picture right that these instructions or guidelines came to us over 1400 years ago mm-hmm. and people back then didn't get the, the detailed wisdom behind all of these things They're like here's what you have to do here's your your roadmap to success and people did it uh, it's now that we're learning some of these fringe benefits that nobody realized so in the prayer for example um, the past decade or so, had, there's been a big push on mindfulness, right? Mindful meditation. Mm-hmm. And prior to that, it was all about meditation, right? That you blank your mind out, don't think about anything, and and that's how you reflect and you know just uh, orient yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then came this concept that no, maybe you should add something to that state where you're thinking and contemplating and focused on something very specific. That's the prayer. You know, we're focused on our Lord and Creator. We're focused on how we can maintain and improve that relationship. And secondly, we're uh, focused on how we can better ourselves by supplication or just recognizing that all success comes from a particular source. And uh, any failures that we encounter are also part of the the greater wisdom than than we have. Mm -hmm. And not to get too uh, hung up over all those things. The fasting that we're doing now as well. um, The fact that there is a regenerative effect of that fasting on our bodies is something that people didn't know back then. But now we're realizing that that's why you see all these intermittent fasting. Um, you know, it's become a fad now. But mm-hmm. for us, it's just been a way of life, not just in Ramadan, but also outside as well. Mm-hmm. So. Even like with intermittent fasting, they always talk about um, how it will kill cancer cells and it kills mm-hmm. bad cells and everything. And then even they did a study on cancer rates around the world. And they found that the lowest rates of cancer rates were basically around like the Middle East area. So like, why is in this region lower cancels because people there still smoke and do stuff mm-hmm. and are, eat crazy or obese or this or have hypertension all these different health right. effects right but one month out of the year they fast for ramadan so they're in and of itself that month is almost like that physical reset so it's interesting then to see like mm-hmm. okay wait a minute so there has to be some sort of reason scientifically right, right. so like you said spiritually we're told hey do this but now we're seeing all the health benefits and implications later. And then going back to the mindful meditation, I kind of laugh at that every time like I like someone kind of talks to me about this because people will do meditation. They'll wake up early, 5 a.m., right, and meditate. And what do they do when they meditate? They'll say, okay, manifest to the universe and say this or write down what you're grateful for every day mm-hmm. and all these things. And I'm someone who actually I even practice it in the sense of I tend to want to write down what I'm grateful because sometimes it's hard to just – conceptualize i'll try to write it down in a journal or something which is again that's a healthy habit to have but i find it funny where they'll wake up 5 a.m do all these things like you that's basically what muslims do too we wake up for fajr and then in it said that there's so much blessing in the time after fajr like to do work or get things going and there's so much blessing in it but people always say like early bird gets the worm you know the success comes Mm -hmm. with the people who wake up early 4 a.m hit the gym so it's it's like they find out that that's such a good benefit to them physically in this realm without spirituality in it. But spiritually, we were told to do it anyways. So then it kind of shows, again, like how 14 years ago we were taught to do this. And now people are saying, like, oh, got to wake up 4 a.m., 5 a.m., be gra- have, have gratitude, go work out, be healthy, all these things. But Islam taught you that already. So it's kind of cool to see, again, how that oh, mix happens. Definitely. And sometimes it takes the secular world to make people realize some of the things that we've had in our faith for, for all these centuries, you know, for over a thousand years. Mm-hmm. What would you recommend to a new Muslim nowadays? Because me personally, in my life, I've had people come up to me asking about Islam and are curious. And I've given them Qur'ans and one by one. And they're saying, okay, so how do I pray? Okay, so what's the premise of the prayer? How do I do it properly? And obviously when you read it, it's and you give them the translation and the transliteration and then saying, okay, you can say it in English, just understand what you're saying first, then kind of learn how to say it in Arabic. And one by one, like what's the step, I guess you would say, from someone who's brand new to Islam who wants to learn more and get into like learning about the prayer? Okay. I'll only respond to this because uh, I have experience with it because mm-hmm. I'm no authority in this matter whatsoever. But um um, there is no single answer to that. Right? Mm-hmm. You have to really evaluate the individual, understand their circumstances, their abilities, their interests, their willingness, because what you 
realize very quickly is that there's a people there's people in a very broad spectrum who come to Islam. Some of them are seeking an answer that they've been trying to find for years and years and they've studied and studied and they know a lot. And there's others who don't know much at all but just have this feeling inside and and they feel a click with Islam. Mm-hmm. And then there's people all the way in between. So what you have to do is is recognize who you're re- dealing with and and what their abilities are and their interests are and then there's a tailored path for every single person and for those who are on one end of it who are really eager and excited they can start right away and learn overnight and you know within days they have results and there's others who are more deliberate in their actions where you have to be deliberate as well and take the time to to teach them at a pace where not only they can learn reasonably but they're not put off by being overwhelmed by all the changes that they have to make in their lives because some of these people um are welcomed in in their own communities by their decision whereas others are rejected by their decisions and that is something that has to be factored in because on top of all that if you pile on all the homework and studying and everything you have to learn of the do's and don'ts it can get a bit too much it's it can get too much for our our own selves and our own communities let alone those who are just new to it have no other support other than whoever they know in the mosque as well so it's a tailored program but it really is it comes down to the basics that you have to start with the prayer and do the best that you can to to learn that and to be able to do the minimum requirements of it and then from there you build and and keep growing right everything else is a bonus uh, from there yeah so. no i love that answer and it's interesting that you even mentioned the fact that even in someone who's born muslim you still have to go through that habba habba like little by little experience of learning about islam and becoming more muslim even with the quran like it was revealed over 23 years mm-hmm. right but then the first 7 years in like Mecca Medina area like alcohol wasn't banned for first 7 years even though for 7 years the Quran was being basically portrayed in Muhammad so right so so so, so it's like interesting to think like if, but yet now if someone becomes muslim it's like now you have to stop this 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 stop doing this all at once it's like yeah. it's impossible that's not even how at the prophet's time they used to do it so then you're expecting people now we're not like the people back then we're not we're every generation is not going to be better and better it's going to be a little bit worse a little bit worse as time goes on So it's like not as good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying well, obviously like the difference between like the I because I remember reading this somewhere like I think it was a hadith or somewhere where it's like each generation is like overall comprehensively not as so the it's same a, as the prophet, right? It's like the, there's like a I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's so the hadith and be careful the word choice is very careful yeah. in the hadith and it also has implications right in terms of the connotation of those words. Mm-hmm. So the, the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said <laughs> the best of generations is my generation. then those who follow them and then those who follow them mm-hmm. he never said everybody else is worse mm-hmm. he just yes. said these okay, are the I best yeah. so we can say they are less best and we are less best I see right? okay, yeah, yeah. as opposed to the, the negative part of it coming in and saying mm-hmm. worse right uh, yeah. so just again it's a no, word, like word, word play but it's important because it, yeah. it affects your psyche it affects how you you look at it and don't think of it in a negative mm-hmm. term but more in the positive term that we are the best that we can be relative to the people who came before us who are better mm-hmm. and there's nothing we can do to get to that level but we can strive for it yeah. and we can be the best in our level mm-hmm. right so and i also read somewhere where it was um like the tests now are essentially harder than the tests then in a way because of like how s- i remember i don't know exactly where i read it but it was saying like how the tests are harder like the temptation is more now even and the ability even now is more but it kind of makes sense because nowadays like for example back then like how many people did you really interact with in the day to day but now with phones technology internet you can see so much content so many things 24/7 at the touch of a finger touch of a button so then it kind of shows like our tests and trials almost become more demanding in certain regards as well so it's like if the tests harder then the reward is like the reward is more or so like the reward's more for the test you go through so i remember reading something like that where it's yeah. like as the generations go similar like yeah thing. so that's more um so there's a personal side to that and then there's the communal side to that right mm-hmm. so on the communal side yes trials and tribulations will increase and we're seeing that in our times as well right with wars and um you know all this all the problems that we're seeing in the world whether it's political social economic uh food all of that um is a huge challenge so those things were predicted and and yeah. prophesied that they will happen and then on a personal level as well um that we have to recognize that this life is all about tests and trials mm-hmm. and we all have to go through them 
And the people who are more beloved to God will experience more challenging trials. It's just like anything that you go through in life. To get to the next level, you have to go through some rite of passage. If you're playing video games, you have to level up to, to get to where you want to be. Yeah. And that's just part of leveling up. When you get there, you know that what you're going to face, the boss level, the boss at that level is going to be harder than what you dealt with before. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with faith as well, is that as you level up, you have to face bigger and bigger challenges. And those might not be physical challenges. They might be mental challenges. They might be uh, anxieties. They might be different types of things or challenges around you that affect you rather than being on you specifically. And you just have to be ready. And that's that's the part of this conditioning that we do, whether it's the prayers, the fasting, the, the spiritual side of things, is there to arm us so that we have the skills and the perks we need to be able to go and you know take care of those battles. Yeah, I love that. And... Thank you again for the clarification as well. Because I know, like, it's when I guess like you're obviously when you're more experienced, you've heard it a couple more times. It's easier for me. It's I've read it. Okay, I read it once, twice, but mm -hmm. sometimes you have to read it a third, fourth, fifth time to really even right. comprehend it. Because sometimes even when you get advice, you'll hear it a hundred times, yeah. and but then someone will say it a certain way the hundred and first time, and it'll click. Right. So again, like knowledge and well, that's kind of how it's pushed and spread. Absolutely. It's like when the conversation keeps happening. So thank you for no, no worries. Yeah, it's never ending. This journey is never ending. You yeah. learn from wherever you can, right? You. You take that opportunity. Of course. Sure. And going back to, again, like the prayer and like kind of going into being a new Muslim. And another like new Muslim had kind of asked me and had to ask this question and said, so I became Muslim, but it's not, I've noticed like I kind of gave him this advice a little bit, but I kind of want you to elaborate that it's not just, okay, I'm becoming Muslim now, I'm done. But it's like a whole new way of life than what you were accustomed to. And especially if you're the first one in your family to convert, and you revert back to Islam, so then you're, okay, now I'm the only Muslim in my family that some people want me to go home and celebrate Easter with them, but I don't feel comfortable celebrating Easter anymore, or Christmas, or this, but how do I just make dua for them? Do I pray for them? What if so, oh, one of my family members have already passed? Then what? So then it's this concept of, am I healing generational trauma or this? Or, so what's, what's your kind of like... Seeing, yeah, you know, I mean, that's a tough one. And again, it really is uh, different individual to individual, right? There's some people who are like a fish to water and, and jump in and feel really comfortable in their new skin. And others who have to go through a lot to, to reconcile what they've done. That's why when I talk to people who have recently accepted or to come to the mosque and say that they want to accept, uh, the first thing that I ask them is, what do you understand about the faith? And the second thing I ask is, <clears throat> what do you understand about what you're leaving behind? Because it's not enough to say that I adopt this new faith. Mm -hmm. It actually is a conscious decision to leave behind a faith that may be contradictory and all the beliefs that go along with it, as well as practices that may be contradictory to this new faith. So do you understand the implications? And some people do and others don't. And literally they are um, drawn to and attracted to the faith in its, its simplicity and its purity. And that brings them there without any regard to what that means in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that the people are passionate about a truth that they've realized that they want to go in and get to. And sometimes the barrier to getting there can be the anxiety and nervousness about what are all the things I have to do to actually earn that and deserve this faith versus let me go jump in now and then figure all those things out later and I'll learn to swim. And I have people helping me around do, to do that. So you really have to take it step by step and in a measured way to make sure that the person who is an avid learner and, and a seeker um, can get what they need to nourish them and to replenish them and to get them excited and energized. And the people on the other end who have no idea what they're doing, but know it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then make sure that you hold their hand and take them through that journey and, and make them realize that it's a slow and steady wins the race concept, not a first to the finish line you know, to get somewhere. Because there is no finish line. There, there, it's a never-ending journey that we have to go through throughout our lives. And the end results, and I always say this, are based on the effort, not mm -hmm. on the outcomes. Yeah. And I know that's also based upon intention as well, right? It's like the intention behind something. So it's like, mm -hmm. My intention is to do something pure, to do something good, but it didn't really work out that way. And it actually failed, and it actually was bad what I did, but my intention was pure. So you don't get judged based on that, you get judged based on your intention. So it's kind of sweet because even in life, people always say, like, it's so easy to judge others on what they're doing and actions. Oh, they just did this. Oh, they just did that. But you don't know what their intention were. But for yourself, it's so easy. Oh, but they don't know what I really meant. Oh, you don't know what I meant by that. But you always saw as the action. So we judge ourselves based on our intention, but we judge others on their actions. So it's kind of like 
even like Allah like will judge us based on bad intention as well. So it's cool to think that we ourselves judge ourselves' intention. Allah will judge intentions, but it's so easy for us to judge on like, people's actions. So it's nice that you kind of brought that in as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, the intentions are the precursor to any of the actions that we take, and that really defines where that outcome is going to go. Because someone who works really hard and struggles for the right intentions. You know, where is that going to take them versus someone who struggles and isn't able to make what they expected of themselves, but had the right intentions, they will be rewarded for that and will be accepted from them. Inshallah, yeah. yeah. So I want to ask this, maybe it might be a personal question for me, at least, like for me to ask you as well, just as someone else, because I kind of had this thought myself, was when you kind of start becoming more Muslim, right? And it's one of my favorite students in the Quran is al Kabut, where again, it's like, surely then you will be tested. If you say, I believe in God, you'll be tested. So then... When that happens, you notice, like, oh, yeah, I am being tested. I kind of notice, oh, here's another test. I got to be patient. I got to be patient. Or, oh, this is happening. Don't lose your temper. Okay, don't do this. Don't do this. But then you do really well and you feel great. You're like, oh, two months I haven't done this thing that I don't want to do. Okay, three months, a year. Oh, look at me. I'm going. I feel good about it. But then what happens then when, say, someone kind of falls back into it and feels kind of like, why did I fall back into this when I was so good for so long? Or why am I going through this again when I thought I'd already beat this? This level. I thought I passed that level last. I thought I beat the boss already. So then what happens when it shows up? Is it showing up because, again, like the never ending journey, or is it another level of that same boss? Yeah, that's a good question. And a good thing you brought the video game analogy out because I think that is a good way to sum it up, right? That sometimes you have to fall back, right? You, you realize that the skills that you'd worked so hard to develop, either you've been slacking or something stopped you from your ability to be able to execute. Mm-hmm. And now you say, you know what? Let me go to retrain myself. And you end up falling back, whether it's a mistake. Or whether it's it's barriers that are there that's preventing you from moving forward that actually push you back. And the sooner you recognize that and realize that this is all part of the test, right? That we are not designed to be machines that are perfect. We are human beings with a capacity and guidance, the capacity to do good and the capacity to do not good. Mm-hmm. And um, a map, a roadmap for success. If we follow the roadmap as simple as it is, we'll be fine. But as soon as we start moving left and right and trying to go explore other areas and complete the whole map and do 100%, yeah. um, then sometimes that 100% can drag us down paths that are, are not appropriate for us. Because mm-hmm. rather than doing 100%, we actually go negative. And, um, and so when that happens, the reminder for us is to just find your way back, get on the path. Even if you're a mile back, it doesn't matter. Just go through it. And if you do that, it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Right? All those side transgressions can be overlooked and ignored as long as we come back and, and make up for it and, and move on. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and that's the beauty of our faith. And, and this is something that makes Islam very unique compared to other faiths, that our salvation, our end result of being successful is based on our intentions as well as our actions from the time that we reach adulthood until we die. With the balancing factor of uh, forgiveness, right, and the fact that we can go back to, to God and ask for um, uh, some sort of leniency for the transgressions that we've done. We may not deserve it, but we can ask. And if we're sincere in that asking, it'll be forgiven. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about plus and minus. There's things that will be completely erased from our record because of our efforts and our sincerity in that. So the combination of these things is what leads to our salvation. And that is, for me personally, and I hope for humanity, what gives us hope. right? Because mm-hmm. this world is in a state where uh, hope is something very hard to find these days. And when you look at it from this perspective, you say, regardless of what I'm going through right now, whatever, regardless of what's happening in the world, whether it's political, whether it's wars, whether it's environment, whatever a cause is that someone is passionate about, whatever it is, there's a wisdom behind it. And as soon as I find my track and I stick to it, even if there's setbacks, I know I'll be successful if I keep going and plugging. So I think that's the, the way I look at it, at least. Mm. No, I really thank you for that answer. And going off of that, something else that kind of got my gears turning as well is... I sometimes personally as well, like I kind of have this experience where say if I do a sin or I do something wrong, then I'll be feel so guilty and so shameful and I feel so distraught because I've almost trained again like my body to be like you said, like we're not machines, but as much as I can, I've like mapped out my days almost like a machine where it's like, okay, this is what I'm going to eat today. This is what I need to do. My workout of the day, my fitness thing of the day. These are my tasks of the day. I have to study this for five minutes, do this for this minutes. Okay, these are my five weekly goals. These are my weekly goal for this thing I do, this thing I do, and this thing I do. And I map it all out, make little check boxes, and cross off the check box when I get it done. Oh, today is this, read just this. Okay, the net check, check, you know, and you do this thing. And I've gotten conditioned to the point where if I don't check 
almost all the boxes off, I feel like I failed the whole day, mm. right? And it is good because it's motivating me and holding me accountable, but also then it gets me a little distraught where I'm like, oh, if I don't do this, then I'll fail. I'll fail mm. the day. I won't get my experience points today. Right. But then aesthetically, though, like that's like physical realm world stuff, dunya stuff, right? Then, then there's things like, okay, I won't get be successful if I ever do this sin or I won't be this success or you equate your success in this life to even doing a sin. It's like, well, if I do this sin, I'll never get this reward of this life or this. But how do you kind of get your mind out of that mentality when you care so much about your faith or your deen or your khlet, but then when you mess up, you feel like, oh, now I'll be punished in this life and the next. Or you get, again, that negativity mindset when you do wrong. Right. So kind of how do you... I guess trick your brain or what do you would you say to do to kind of get out of that mindset? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And I'll, I'll tell you my personal experience and how I've reconciled through that. And um, it's been over a years-long process of understanding how the system works. And, and this applies to anything in life. This is like a life lesson, right? That mm-hmm. once you understand how a system works, you know how to beat it and you know how to hack it, right? Mm-hmm. There's ways to do that. And sometimes the hacking part of it can be negative or it can just be shortcuts that you, you pick up over time. It's not negative, not usually a ne- always a negative thing, right? Mm-hmm. So the foundational principle in Islam goes back to that fact that we're not machines. Mm-hmm. Right? We have been designed in a particular way for a reason. It's not that we're designed to fail. It's not that we're designed with a fault. But it's just that we are human beings. We're separate from other creation who are programmed to do one thing and one thing only, which is whatever they do in their lives, right? Mm-hmm. Other creatures and so on and so forth. But we have that ability to tr- to move away from the baseline programming and explore other areas. And some of those could be good and some of those could be bad. If we understand that, then we we have to accept the fact that every human being is different. We all have different capacities. We all have different tendencies. We all have different likes and dislikes or whatever else. And as a result of that, we have a custom journey through these maps, right, through this life. And... We also recognize that we'll never be perfect. There's no way that any human being can be perfect. And, and the best of us was the Prophet ﷺ. He could be the Same. epitome of that, right? So our goal is to strive to follow his example to the best of our abilities. And that includes recognizing that we make mistakes. And if we make mistakes, we follow the program. We look at the system and say, okay, here's what the program says. Number one, avoid mistakes. Mm-hmm. Number two, you will not going to be able to avoid mistakes. Mm-hmm. So number three, make up for them. And there's tons of ways to make up for mistakes. So if we keep a positive mindset, we know that every time something happens, uh, we have to do something to compensate for whatever we've done. This is why the Prophet ﷺ taught the best of generations, the people who were the best uh, Mm -hmm. after him, him, um, that whenever you sin, whenever a person sins, and they immediately go and and do wudu and they pray two rakahs, two units of prayer, Mm -hmm. uh, sincerely, and ask for forgiveness, they'll be forgiven. Mm-hmm. So it's not an encouragement to go and sin and then go pray too. That's not how you hack the system, mm-hmm. right? The hack is knowing that when that time comes, I know that if I slip and fall, I have a way to to make up for it. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be ready when that time comes. So that is the hack. Yeah. Uh, and the rest is just learning to have that positive mindset that anything that happens was meant to happen. And this is where we've learned in numerous accounts from the Prophet Sallallahu where he said to the effect of that, you know, if... Um, something happens and it's done, we should never ever say that, oh, if I had done such and such, I would not have done it, right? That's a very well-known statement, Mm -hmm. right? Because uh, of two things. One, that if opens the door for the devil, Mm -hmm. right? And what does that mean? It makes us second guess. It makes us doubt. It makes us go into this vicious cycle and it doesn't help us move forward, right? Um, And it's not a positive. Number two, it's not a positive thing. It's a negative type of thinking. So in the contrary, we say in the same statement, um, mm-hmm. That this is what was decreed by my Lord and Creator And He decrees whatever He wishes mm-hmm. And I may not understand the wisdom of why I slipped and fell But there was a wisdom behind it And if that wisdom was that I'm going to be more devoted to my Lord And to ask forgiveness sincerely from my heart and cry That might be an outcome that is worth that slip Again, not saying to justify anything But mm-hmm. saying we do our best to avoid circumstances knowing that there will be situations that we come across where we end up doing something that we will regret instantly. Mm-hmm. And as the sooner we regret and the sooner we make up, the better it is for us and uh, for others as well. Yeah, no, I would love that answer. And it's interesting because I even had this like emotional experience mentally where I'm like, okay, if I make this sin, I go tawbah and I actually do raka, right, to units of prayer of, oh Allah, please forgive me, like, 
like I, I feel so shameful that I did this or I hurt this person's feelings or I, I lost my temper playing soccer. I did this or I did all these little things that happen throughout your life. But it happens to a person, say you do it again and again, and it's like you keep going back again and again. But what's what happens almost when there's the point where it's like you almost feel like ashamed to go to your Lord to ask forgiveness when you feel like I did it again. Like you almost feel so like almost so shameful even to go ask for forgiveness. Like what happens at that level where it's like we because again a human experience like that's a normal experience to feel like it's normal to feel that way but like how do you kind of get over that i guess that hurdle as well where yeah. it's like where you said you do like the look you look at the game plan okay coach said do this so you do it but what happens when you do it but your inner self isn't working you're still you're still not scoring a goal so then what's kind of like your yeah you- no that's very important to understand as well right? because those feelings are natural and our number one priority is to suppress those feelings as quickly as we can Mm-hmm. Because all of those that are, are are doubts and whispers that are being put into our brain to weaken our connection with our Lord and Creator. Whereas the reality is we're being told, this is what you will do. You've done it. Yes, be ashamed. Don't justify it. Don't ever feel that this is okay because of X, Y, and Z. Right? Mm-hmm. Never get into that trap, but make up for it right away. As quickly as you can, make up for it and you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. But if you wallow in self-pity or you get depressed about it and getting anxious about it and that weakens that connection because now what you, what what does that really mean right if you're feeling embarrassed and and saying oh you know how can i go back to god that is literally saying that you don't think god will forgive you mm-hmm. and that is an accusation it's not just a statement mm-hmm. and that is something that we can never even come close to saying mm-hmm. so yes it's natural to sometimes feel that way but we need to banish those thoughts immediately and get back on the wagon and just say, okay, you know what? I know what I have to do. This is this is my prerogative is to seek forgiveness, and I will do that. Because mm-hmm. whatever happened was meant to happen. And now that it's passed, what can I do? I can't mm-hmm. go back and think about it because that's negative. I can learn a lesson and say, what circumstances led to that happening? And how can I avoid those and do, be better at it day by day by day? Mm-hmm. And that's a lifelong struggle. That's not going to change because yeah. there's some things that are easier to give up, and there's others that are much harder. And as I said earlier, it's the effort and the struggle that is going to define the victory, not the end result. Mm-hmm. No, I love that again. Love the answer. And thank you for, again for like sharing that. Because again, for me, someone 25 years old, you know, kind of, I'm in that age of again, your 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 lobes are now fully starting to be fully developed. So you're getting to that age of now. It's okay. This is how my brain's probably going to be your operating, inshallah, for a little bit. You know, this is like your personality kind of sets. Who you are as a person is kind of understood. You do certain things. You have certain careers you like doing, certain things, hobbies, passions that you're kind of noticing is a reoccurring event, right? So then going into like being this person and using Islam as like the guideline and improving yourself, right? Self-development, all these different things that improve your life. What is something that within Islam you think is a common misconception that maybe people don't really understand or don't really know that is part of Islam as well? Wow, that's a tough one. Where do you begin, right? There's um, there's so many things, but uh, I think the basics are the most important. Is What people don't realize is what we define as God or our Creator. Mm-hmm. And if people understood that, I think it would open the door for people to want to learn more about the faith as well. And what I mean by that is that the concept we have of this creator is not a human-like figure sitting somewhere controlling things and, and being the boss of, of everything. It's a, a being that we cannot fathom or imagine, who has no connection in a physical sense <clears throat> with whatever has been created. Mm-hmm. So that distinction between the creator and the created is something that people don't really understand too well. And I think if they did, if they took the time to do that, that would change their perspective on everything that follows. And, and I'll give you an example, right? So what do I mean by this? It, it means for us in, in Islam that God or this almighty being cannot have any attributes that are distinct and unique uh, as part of the creation, mm-hmm. right? That are, are sp- specific for the creation. And the creation at the same time can't have any attributes that are distinct and unique to God. Mm-hmm. So God for us is all merciful, right? And always giving out mercy. Human beings can be merciful. We have that quality as well. But can we be infinite in our mercy and and have the ultimate mercy? No, we can never reach that level. Mm-hmm. So similarly, God is all seeing, all knowing. We can know things, but we'll never have that full knowledge of, of everything. So that line of demarcation is important because where faith systems get um, 
I, from my perspective, sidetracked, is blurring that line of either the creation having attributes that are unique to God or God being brought down to a level that is more creation-like. Mm-hmm. And, and because from there stems everything else. So if this creator is above and beyond the creation and is telling me that I have to believe certain things and I have to act a particular way and I have to do certain things, then that action becomes easier for me knowing that it's someone who knows not only me but everything else that's been created as well and has full knowledge and wisdom. And I have to trust that wisdom to get me through the mental blocks that are preventing me from going down that path. Mm -hmm. So abstract answer to your question, but that's just one way of looking at it. No, I like that. And kind of going off that is when someone, I guess, when someone, again, is learning about Islam, all these things, sometimes I've had conversations with so many people who are like, you know what? Hmm. If there's a designer and we're designed and... Our mothers aren't our designers. They're just kind of like the manufacturer. So something had to have designed us. There's millions of miles of blood vessels in our bodies. Our lungs, our hearts, birds, the way they fly, everything is so perfectly organized in this world, right? Mm-hmm. The Fibonacci sequence, even you go back to like mathematical things, like all, all these things, there's so much beautiful design. Like this can't just be a chance, right? There's a create, there's a, someone created this, right? something someone the universe whatever it is it's like some people have this thought right when you kind of one by one kind of break it down right so what like could you say to people maybe who they believe that there's some sort of creator there's this universe there's energy but they can't conceptualize or understand allah with prophets like how do you kind of base that because again to some people they'll read old scriptures old torah old, old bible the quran things like oh um it's just like an old scripture or these stories, but how do you know this happened really? Or how do you really know this? How do you really know that? So again, because there's so many people like that nowadays where they believe in something using science, logic, reason, but the spiritual part kind of isn't there. It's not hitting, I guess. Mm -hmm. What would you kind of say or recommend to someone like me to say it's someone or someone listening as well? Right. So it again depends on where they are on the scale of of that um, journey of searching and asking questions versus just being curious. Mm-hmm. versus looking for a fight. Because mm-hmm. there are people across yeah. that, right? There are people oh who, <laughs> who say that and they, all they want to do is debate and prove that they're right and you know, you're wrong. Uh, and there's people who are very genuinely interested in finding a truth. So the people who are on that side of the equation, um, what I tell them to do is, and I actually flip things around, but, but to start off with, um, I would say that it's unfathomable to think that everything that we see around us on this earth just came into existence out of nothing, just through science and through some you know, miracle of this Big Bang or whatever else led to all the different paths that had things had to be perfectly aligned on for us to be here talking today and, and the world to be where it is. It's very unlikely. On the flip side of it, you know, the risk of not having this, or actually, let me put it a different way, that I would say that if we eliminate that part of it and say that there has to be some system that is correct, how do you differentiate between them and what's the criteria used to identify what is the right belief to have? And my challenge, and this is not my challenge, this is the Islamic challenge. What God is saying is that in the Quran, for example, that everything around you is for you to ponder and think about and reflect mm. and see if it helps you make that connection with this higher being. And so I would say, put all the different fates in front of you. Spend an hour, two hours, whatever it takes to evaluate each one in depth in terms of beliefs, in terms of actions, in terms of whatever else you want to look at, and come to a conclusion in terms of what is the one that resonates the most in terms of both this life as well as what's to come afterwards. Mm -hmm. And work backwards, so basically work backwards. Do that evaluation and then use it to bridge the gap in in, in that chasm, right, which is why do I have to connect between knowing that there's some being out there and a particular fate system? Why can't it just be an agnostic belief that, yeah, I respect that there's yeah. some someone who created all this, but I don't know who they are. I don't mm-hmm. care, right? And then the, the question becomes, what's the risk of not making that, that jump? Right? And the risk is, if you look at any of the major systems um, in their pure form, uh, there are penalties and consequences to making the wrong choice. Mm-hmm. And in Islam, that is very, very clear. Our system has not changed over the years. It is the way it was, that we believe that there is one creator, and that one creator has given us a path to success in our lives. And if we follow that path, we'll be fine. Mm-hmm. If we choose an alternate path, we're not going to be fine. What mm-hmm. that means varies, again, person to person. Are we willing to take that chance when 
the path that we've been prescribed is very simple and easy. It's not complicated. So I really would turn the tables there rather than trying to yeah. justify something and to, you know, to make them uh, follow based on my evidences. I would say make that evaluation on your own. There's a lot of no- information about different faiths already. Pick the one you think is the, is the one that will get you to success and then ask yourself why you're not there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I love the answer. And it's interesting because I remember even having a conversation where someone had told me again, I was judging Islam so harshly because I wanted to know why, like, why am I right? Why are they wrong? Why are they right? Why am I wrong? And all these different questions. But I started noticing that they were judging Islam so harshly. But then, they, like you said, started judging the same harshness of their own faith, ju- judging and saying, like, is it my right to other ones? And they were like, wait a minute, I was judging my own faith so hard, but none of these religions kind of kept up with the logic, the reason, and then it kind of led me back to it. And I was like, okay, cool. Then I'll stick stick through with it. And there was another uh, story with uh, this guy on YouTube, like Yusuf Estrats, Yusuf Estrats. Estes. Estes, right? And he kind of said, like, he used to be, again, like a preacher. like, And he was like the choir director, preacher. And he literally had, like, a Muslim friend at one point, And he told him, like, I'll, become, I'll convert to Christianity if it's better than mine. And he was like, okay. And he started like, researching Islam. And this is someone who, again, preacher, choir director, and then became Muslim because he was like, he, he, he was right. Like, there wasn't anything better to it. It made the most sense. It had logic, reason, science behind it. And I think for me, like, something I'll, I guess, like, not, so you're not selling Islam, but, like, sometimes I'll, like, talk to people about Islam. They're asking questions about it. I'll tell them all the, like, the little scientific things that just I can't explain regardless. And it's so logically understood. Or even in like the surah, the, the, like the bee, where it literally talks about like the female bee being like the worker. Mm-hmm. But then later now, like I said, science finds out how many years later mm-hmm. that the worker bee is the female bee. Right. And how, why is it so linguistically perfect? Or when it talks about things like, um, uh, like mountains are like, like mountains like pegs, or even saying things like um, the embryonic system, like mm-hmm. from like the sperm to the zygote to the, and the processes of it and what it looks like, what it, the evolution of it. But it's like this is a illiterate man in the desert fourteen fifteen hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. How is that even possible? And the Quran has been unchanged, untouched for all those years. So and there's only one version. So then you start to think, okay, that's something that can kind of make someone ponder and think. And I guess that's for me, like what I what I tend to also say. But I love the answer too. It's like I've noticed some people will be like you said. I believe there's something out there, but I don't know. Right. So then I love like how yeah, you I appreciate that. And there's other people as well um, on the other end of that who are just disenfranchised. They they want a system. They want to follow something. But wherever they are, they're not finding that fulfillment in it. And and the reason for that is very simple, right? Like you said, our system has stayed the same. Right? We evolve according to the times. But our core values do not change, and we don't have the right to change them. Whereas other fates, not only have they evolved, they've changed as a result of circumstances, societies, or leaders, or whoever else. And that has left people wondering, do they really belong there anymore? Because they can't seem to reconcile between what they're reading in their scriptures and what they're seeing in their houses of worship. Mm -hmm. And that makes them go on a journey to find something. And sometimes it's not any of the scientific evidences and all those things. It's just the comfort of knowing that there's a safe haven, there's a place where not only are these values being maintained, but there's a direct correlation between what's in the books and what people are doing and saying. Mm-hmm. And, and so that attracts them as well. And then they figure out all the other things and, and get into it. But, um, yeah, yeah, it no. varies. You know, I love, again, I love the answers. And it really is like nice for me, even here again, someone who's born Muslim and stuff, but had to like see the world and then really dive into Islam obviously getting older because like when you're younger you're like la 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 you know kind of just going through life you're obviously uh, come pray okay pray like, you don't really understand you're younger you're like okay I'm here I'm at prayer at night when I'm 12 13 years old and I'm like just thinking okay when's this whenever this uh, raka is over I can go upstairs and play ping pong if I can right. you know it's like you're, you're a kid you're thinking that but when you get older you one by one you kind of realize okay why and you start asking your question like why is this system actually making me the best version of myself that I can be? How is it improving myself? And when I started doing it like more seriously, I started noticing how my life got better in like the physical realm. And I was like, okay, I spiritually feel calmer. Even if I'm more anxious or have more stress, but there's still a sense of calm and peace and serenity that still kind of falls over me. So it's like, how is it more stress or more anxiety that five years ago, me, 10 years ago, me wouldn't have been able to handle, right. but now me gets more, but then I'm able to handle it because having that belief system yeah. so i guess one of the things that i want to ask you about because again going forward with like life and different generational gaps is and i talk about this all the time obviously like people love talking about this but like 
getting married in today's society, in today's day and age, and what we see around us and everything, and it's like halal dating, but there's no dating in Islam. Okay, so like how do you to find courtship? But then nowadays you're notice we're noticing like even in America, at least in the West, like all these divorce rates are spiking up. Even in like Eastern countries we're noticing is starting to go up as well. Even with Islam in place, because people are just getting this feeling of like I guess like this world like vibe, you know, where the internet kind of connects everyone, right? right? To this one big internet culture, this life culture. And it's become harder than find that perfect person, that spouse. Everyone thinks, oh, they're out there somewhere. Look at all these options we have all around the world that we can potentially reach into contact to. So what would you kind of recommend to someone, I guess, my age or people around me that are it's like you kind of see the difference as someone who's like, okay, hold up. There is a difference here. Because some people, like, they'll be like, oh, no, do what we did. But it's like we can't. As in, you know, when you're 25, you're trying to tell, like, obviously older parents or people, like, hey, it's a little different field than you kind of were playing. And so what would you kind of say or talk about in this situation? Uh, that's a really tough question to answer, especially in this day, day and age. Like you said, um, it's shifted a lot since even my generation, right? Not too mm-hmm. long ago, a couple of decades ago, it's, uh, it's shifted a lot. But I think the simple advice I would have, and we were talking about this earlier, is that um, if you look at the Islamic construct of marriage, right? You mentioned it yourself, that um, the way we're told the interaction between spouses is like garments, right? You are garments to each other, right? Mm-hmm. Um, paraphrasing. And, and that has implications to it in terms of what that means, protection, adornment, whatever else it is. So if we use that as the analogy and think about this big life decision we're about to make, we can either go along with the trends and fashions of the day, because ultimately that's what happens, right? We look at the people around us and that's how we base our life decision in terms of what we wear, what we're going to uh, watch, what we listen to, what, what we're doing, how we walk, everything, right? What we mm-hmm. choose. Uh, everything is about what people around us are doing. And what our faith teaches us is don't do that. Mm-hmm. Don't make the people around you the sole basis for your decision. If what they're doing lines up with God's expectations of you and his guidance, great, follow it. But if it doesn't, and especially if it's going in the opposite direction, then think very carefully about what you're doing. So when it comes to a choice of a life partner, really that's my advice, is that if you're going to think of it from the concept of fashion trends, you'll find a partner like people around you are finding partners. Mm -hmm. And they may not all be Muslims, and they may not all be practicing Muslims or people of faith for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you do that, what will that ultimately get you? Some self-gratification for a time, and once that fad in fashion passes then you'll be left just like everybody else wondering, okay, what do I do now? As opposed to what our faith and and a lot of our cultures teach us is think of the long game. What is the ultimate purpose of having a partner in your life? Is it just to look good for a while or is it to have someone who's going to walk along with you on a path that's going to take you to ultimate success Mm -hmm. far away? And if you think of it from that perspective, then some of the superficial characteristics tend to lose value. I don't say they go away, but they lose value. Mm-hmm. And the longer term um, values are the ones that shine out. Mm-hmm. And if that perspective is used, more often than not, the correct decision will be made mm-hmm. or a better decision will be made. Because you can think of it from the perspective that there's no wrong decision. Getting married and having a family is a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. So people should do their best. And even if they, if they don't follow the advice and do the full best, at least try to do as much as you can and get close to it, as opposed to doing something that's blatantly wrong and. and getting to relationships that are not going to lead anywhere whatsoever and are completely temporary. So uh, that is my simple advice, is think of the long game, have the perspective of the core values that are, are being sought in a spouse and focus on those, even if it means setting aside some of those urges and desires that we have based on whatever's happening around us in the world. Mm-hmm. No, I really do appreciate the answer. And even for me, again, being a 25-year-old man, right, mm-hmm. society today where it's, okay, is it, easily accessible for the average 25 year old man and man to go buy a house and do all these things right now and be like hey uh let's get married and i have this 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 it's a lot harder for the average person to do that now it's getting harder hard obviously inflation the wealth inequality etc 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 student loans you know the list can go on and on if you want to if you get political with it but then islamically it's like okay it's don't worry too it's like don't worry too much about the wealth of the money marry for this but then you see culture like this where you're saying like the fads and society it's like oh i want this i want this kind of car i want this 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 but then it's hard to find like this happy medium where you as i say 
you want to give her the best matter, the best this, the best mm-hmm. that, because you as a man, you want to be able to offer that and give that, but very hard to find that person to give that. It, it's like this like stringing theory of like all these things together where it's like it all has to like align and click. So how does one kind of, I guess, stay constant in patience and constant in like duha and constant in like doing the right things to get to that end goal without kind of like selling themselves short, but also not like selling out like their spiritual or their morals or values? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's hard these days to do that because you do get caught up in in the rat race and the grind, right? But uh, the perspective and the mindset that goes into it is really about saying, you know, what am I really after? What am I looking to get out of this life? <clears throat> mm-hmm. It is if it is to be on par with others and looking at those who've quote unquote uh, gotten to success, then we'll be stuck in that race forever. Mm-hmm. But if we slow down and have that patience to think and say, you know what? Instead of that mindset, I'm going to be content with whatever I have. Mm-hmm. may not be much compared to those who have a lot more, but it definitely is a lot more than those who have a lot less. So I'll work hard. I'll keep that positive mentality in trying to improve my condition and the condition of the people around me. But I'm also going to be content, which also means that finding a partner who is not caught up in, in these kinds of things as well, which yeah. is, again, hard to do these days. But there are people out there who have similar yeah. values. They may not check all the boxes that we have listed on our requirements, <laughs> but they're there. And if we uh, think in, in those terms, then that contentment will translate into relationships that are longer lasting and, and more solid in their foundation rather than the superficial ones that are based on these criteria that have been added you know, and the baggage that we have to live with, that you have to have such and such value or wealth to be able to get to that level. Whereas what does our faith teach us? On one end, it teaches us that you have to have a minimum amount of, uh, of income or wealth to be able to sustain a, a marriage. Otherwise, you don't get married. Because mm-hmm. there's no point both of you suffering by, by the head of household not being able to provide. Mm-hmm. But if you cross that threshold, then get married. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't say get married to someone who's X, Y, and Z or this and that. Get married. So there are people who may be able to be able to accept the reality of living in a particular standard, um, even though their desire may be to be somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But knowing that you know there's a future potential and it's a path that both will work towards together. And, you know... Uh, Hopefully, everybody else will see that as well, because sometimes the pressure comes from within more than it does from without in terms of the expectations. I oh, love that answer. And thank you again for answering a couple of questions. So kind of want to go back to like talking about something again that you said you were proud of and kind of elaborating about being part of like a community, helping build like a, a Muslim community in the area. So I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Yeah, and these are, yeah, and I say that because that's one of the one things I'll publicly share in terms yeah. of what I'm proud of, because I, I do want it to be an example for others. And um it made me really reflect about uh, you know my own background. Um, when I got into this community aspect of things, uh, I wasn't looking for it. I'd, my whole life, I'd never thought I'd be involved in anything of this sort. I wasn't like this growing up in any way. Um, and then a few things happened. One is um, I always deferred to others to take these kinds of steps and said, you know what, when someone does this, I'll go help them. I'll, I'll take care of supporting them in any way that I can. Mm-hmm. And then when we were in this community, um, I came to the realization that if I didn't, then who else would? Mm-hmm. That, in fact, I am that someone else because there's nobody else stepping up to do it. And I'm like, I'm not qualified for this. I don't know anything. I mean, why, why should I do this? And then that goes back to the intentions. I, I went back and, again, this is personal and no, not many people know about it, but I'll share it. You know, I, I really ask God for the strength to, number one, keep my intentions sincere. Mm-hmm. Because we got input and advice from other people, seniors who'd gone through similar exercises, and uh, they said the hardest thing is to you know keep things moving and, and not have negative forces come against you and get in the way. Mm-hmm. And you have to be prepared to to deal with that, both uh, in terms of responding appropriately, but also at the same time having the fortitude to be able to withstand the barrage because it's going to come. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I'd, I'd never thought of or was used to. Um, but you know, by by God's grace, I was able to persevere, overcome uh, those those mental setbacks as well as the the ones that came from outside and recognize that I had to step up. And over time, I think that helped me both uh, contribute towards the, the establishment of the community, but also to grow personally as well and, and you know, become a better person uh, as much as I could, as long as, you know, God accepts what I've done for him, um, you know, year by year, day by day, did the best I could to, to improve on that and, and to help the community. No, yeah. Alhamdulillah, and thank you again for sharing that, because again, it is really, like, inspiring to hear, too, where I love, like, I don't know, for me, when I hear someone say something like, oh, like, who else will, like, I, I guess I'll step, like, you know, it's just like, it's like the, 
it's like the movie thing where it's like the hero's journey where he steps up and picks up the sword you know it's like he does the thing then the story starts so it's like interesting to kind of see like in life it's kind of really how it is like sometimes you'll feel like oh, like i want this to happen like i wish this was this i wish this was this like one can sit and wish for something to happen in the reality or they can get up and go after it yeah. get up and do it and like you said like setting that intention is so pure and like why am i doing this you know and it's even like if i had to share something of mine that kind of i guess relates to it and even if it's not islamic mm -hmm. i guess directly but using social media growing up all the time and then i'm like okay like these are cool and all but now what are they they become this like vat like vast pits of just like degeneracy almost and like not authenticity anymore so then for me i'm like oh, i wonder if there's an app out there that has the x x y z x y z x y z and then i realized it didn't exist and then i'm like okay if it doesn't exist but i want to use it then what do i do mm -hmm. it's like you create it you find a way to get it be, to be created and that's what i've been working on the last like four years nice. and it's interesting because that was a kind of a similar feeling so like when you do have that experience that innate thing where it's like huh let me write it down first like you know let me mm -hmm. see about it. like let me pray on it you know let me mm -hmm. talk to all of them. like let me but then you start noticing like things are drastically changing for you mm -hmm. and like things like the cards start playing out for you and like you're just kind of walking in the steps right. and, like okay like i took another step and then, like you said i knew nothing about whatever yeah i don't know like what am i what do i have to do like what do i know but then when you set that intention, you kind of notice that, like, Allah literally will put, like, the next step in front of you. Just one by one. Because you can't do, like you said, 100 steps all in one jump. Right. Like, you can't go 0 to 100 without hitting all the numbers in between. Mm -hmm. So, it's, like, that energy where it's, like, oh, snap. Like, I can really get there. But it takes, like, one by one. Habba, habba constantly. Where, again, if we were to bring it back to the Islamic mindset mm -hmm. of you don't become the best Muslim overnight. Right. You, oh, you're new to Islam? You don't pray five times a day perfectly with and saying all the perfect things and you're a scholar right, right away. No, it's a lifelong journey. Yeah. So it's cool to see like even how Islamically it builds, physiologically it builds, in your life it builds, and every single thing. So again, like, thank you no, for absolutely. sharing Absolutely. And I'll add to that actually, and this is a story you might have heard, but I'll, I'll say it because um, your family was involved in this as well. Um, when we started on this journey, our community was very small. Mm -hmm. and we didn't have much in terms of resources at all. But what we did have was people who were dedicated and passionate about doing something, mm -hmm. right? And we spent months and months trying to find a place where we could worship together as a community, and, and we were struggling to find that, even to lease a small room where we could um, get together. And, and after all of that, we were able to find a, a location, and we went into all the legal paperwork, we, we signed the contract, and it was a small office. And the city kept discouraging us, like, you know, we, we want to get something for you guys, but if you sign this lease, you'll get like five parking spots, and that's like, I don't know how many, 15, 16 people can come into your, your office, that's it, you don't yeah. get an occupancy. You'll have to rent or lease spaces from somewhere else, otherwise we can't give you more occupancy. Uh, it defeats the purpose. And we're like, no, 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 we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And right at the end, uh, the deal was called off, you know, uh, even though we were we had signed up and everything. And then just a month later, this building showed up, this church came on sale, and uh, we went ahead and we got together. And this is, again, the interesting part of the story, is that we were debating how we were going to fund the purchase of this building that we had no funds to support. Yeah. And... Um, the one thing we all agreed on is that we're not going to get a loan because, as you know, in Islam, interest is, is something that we, we don't follow, mm -hmm. we don't accept. Um, and we said, all right, we'll make the intention. We'll try our best. If it's meant to happen, it will. If it's not, it won't. We're either going to pay this whole building in cash, and we had two months to raise the money to, to pay for this huge building. And, um, and we said, all right, let's do it. And the best part about that is that it eased the whole burden off us. Right? We, we said we left it to Allah. We're going to do our part, and we're not going to stress and get anxious and nervous. If it's meant to happen, it will. If otherwise, we'll move on. And literally within two months, we were able to raise more than what we needed. And that was because people went to different mosques, they went to their places of work, they went to their communities, because uh, we were um, almost like a diaspora. People from New York, New Jersey, uh, mm -hmm. Philadelphia, other places yeah, moved here. All over, yeah. All over, right? And this was the early days. So they did whatever they could, everybody got together, and people supported us all over. And, and that just showed us that, um, you know, like you said, set the intention, do your uh, work, and just trust in the process. If it's meant to happen, it will. If it doesn't, you move on and you learn lessons. No, I love that. And it's mm -hmm. cool because even for me, like I was, I was a kid, you know, like mm -hmm. I wasn't really understanding the concept 100%. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of cool to kind of see that because even for me, 
so many people have told me in like business or in this, hey, would you take a loan out? Hey, would you want to get an investment opportunity with this, but they'll take this much percent or this, mm. but who's giving me the money? What do they want me to do with the money? Right. This is, and all these things, but then everyone's like, man, like, I feel like your religion holds you back, man. Like, you, you could do make more money faster, dude. Why don't you want to work in this field? Mm. Or, dude, you're so smart in this field. Why don't you go work in it and take this money? And they're hiring 100K right now. Right. Come come through. I can get you a job. And I'm like, yeah, but I can't work with that kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, man, all right. And then I'm sitting there, like, biting the bullet. And I'm like, like it's hard to say no to things that you said, like, the easy opportunity, right? The easy thing where you can sell your morals and values for, okay, guaranteed, get the loan, get the building, you're good. But then trusting in Allah and actually having that patience and constancy constancy of patience is like look it's, it's like then you just look back and you smile so big you know like you look back and like alhamdulillah for like the decisions we made together as a community the steps we took and how it all plays out the same way with that lease was you read about a sign everything everything's good but then qadrullah ma shafala right absolutely boom falls apart but then next day next week next month boom something else will kind of turn up in your life so again it's a really like beautiful story to share because it kind of shows like stay true to yourself stay true to your values morals your community your like that to what allah kind of ordained for us and look at how it can turn out better for us yeah and you said something really important there right looking back because you can't look back until you are patient and wait for time to pass right and sometimes Mm -hmm. you're so eager in the moment to get the results and you don't get them and you perceive it negatively but just at like the same time that building that we had signed a lease on we were so deflated when that whole deal was called off mm-hmm. and we were like we worked so hard for so long and this is the outcome you know, what, what does this mean so it made us it shook us a bit mm-hmm. and then literally a month later something better came for us mm-hmm. and that's how it was written and and you don't realize that until you wait and to look back and see you know, what led you to where you are mm-hmm. And sometimes those setbacks can be positive, as I mentioned earlier. They can have a positive impact and effect that uh, can't be neglected. So we should never look at them as penalties or something negative. It's all part of the bumps on the road that we have of this life. Mm-hmm. No, thank you again for sharing that story because it really was like really like eye-opening and like heartwarming to hear as well because so many people can compare that to like things in their life, you know, their own experiences. I can compare it to like, again, a business experience rather than just a Muslim experience, but then how it all ties in together. So I love that. And something I wanted to ask you was, where do you see the world going in five years again with like where we are right now and stuff? Because we were talking about the past, the present, but now let's talk a little bit about where do you see the world going in five years? All right. So this is, uh, I shouldn't call it a prediction, right? Uh, <laughs> God is the owner of prediction or knowing the future and having that full knowledge. But we mm-hmm. do our best to to look at what's happening. And I've lived long enough to see certain things that are cyclical and come back over and over again. But the one trend that has been worrying me uh, over the past um, decade or so is just how polarized the world has become. Mm-hmm. Really, the political polarization, the um, religious polarization, all of that is is scary. And how people are not coming back to the middle. They're, they're staying on those fringes and those ends on, on either side. And I fear that that's going to just get worse because I don't see any forces bringing it back. I mean, our faith, Islam, is one of those forces that is in the middle. We try not to go into extreme on one end or the other. We stay in the middle. But I don't see that in the world of politics, in the world of societies or, or any other places at this time. I hope that is not an accurate prediction, but that's my, my big concern. And the second big one is we're already seeing the AI revolution and how quickly things are changing on a day-to-day basis in our lives. Yeah. It's one thing to have these revolutions that impact certain segments of the society, like manufacturing processes or other things, economics. Um, but something like AI is pervasive across every facet of society. Mm-hmm. From just people living in their homes to people in factories to people in offices, everyone is affected. And five years from now, um, if we're not there, soon after that, there will be a watershed moment when people realize that the um, skills that took years and years to develop are unnecessary, mm-hmm. really unnecessary. Even today, yeah. anyone can be a programmer by just going in and putting a prompt in and saying, you know, program something for me. Mm-hmm. Right? Especially and, like a simple web website, like a basic yeah, thing. Even beyond, even beyond that, even complicated algorithms you can get uh, out mm-hmm. of uh, these AIs, right? So. Uh, people who spent four years learning basic programming now have to think about what am yeah. I going to do now? How do I use this technology to improve myself and add more value versus sitting back and pretending I'm in this bubble, I'll be fine. Yeah. So, And this is going to happen everywhere. Every aspect of society will be touched by it. And that is my uh, fear as well as a, a hope as well. I hope it's used in the right way 
to add value to humanity as opposed to add value, adding value to commercial interests yeah. and, and the capitalist engine that is the world pretty much all over, right? Yeah. Because that could be destructive and it will impact a lot of people in a negative way versus using it in a positive way it can have a, a you know good impact as well. Mm-hmm. I saw a video of a guy, like a coder. He literally he created like a an AI bot. I think, I forgot the name they named it, or Dave or something like that. Something like that. So Devin. Some, Devin, right? Mm-hmm. And they, they created this thing and it was like doing the code and this guy's like building his replacement like mm-hmm. right? you know it's crazy because then it's like so what happened like you said like four years of computer science major all these things now what it's like i'm a, comp- I'm a comp sci major 10 years ago oh you loaded you must be making money you in a job blah, blah blah but then four years what happens to all those people and then even like as i like, say even video editing all these different things there are so many like ais and stuff that literally will help me cut out cut up the episode or add this or add this or help me with transcription and read it for me and then tell me the key points of the episode or this and granted, that's removing painstaking work from me, right? Great. But that's just one segment of one thing. That was someone's job. That was someone's whole career was yeah. this exact thing. But now one person can do eight people's jobs. So then those eight people's jobs now don't exist. Okay, so then everyone kind of lives in this thing and we all use AIs and whoever can use it the best is going to win. But then at one point, it's like who's really winning? Like you said, like it's going to be the cor- commercialization, the corporate corporatization of the AIs, or even when you go into a uh, look at fast food spots and like, okay, there's no need for a server anymore because now you can just order online, boom, 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 click buttons, and it'll be ready for you. You just need one person in the back. Like you said, it's great for oh machinery. Oh, we don't have to pick up heavy things anymore ourselves. Oh, cool, we can use these tow trucks. Nice, right? Ingenuity. Cars that drive themselves. Wow, that sounds really cool. That's. But then eventually, what happens when People again, you said that forget to learn a skill where like truck driving is the most popular state, a popular job in like 25 plus states in America. What happens to all the motel drivers that all these truckers stop mm-hmm. at? What happens to all these places when the trucks are driving themselves? Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So then what happens then? You know, so then it's like, that's again, most all those jobs then vanish. Why? Because of ingenuity of, oh, look, it gets it itself. Less accidents. Wow, it seems all great and dandy at first, but then. Where is the value of work going to go for so many millions of people? Where it's not just high school graduates, but college graduates. Where it's people in the middle, skills, trade jobs. Like how many things can get automated? So then what happens, like you said, the people. So it, it is like a very nerve-wracking thing to look at. No, it is. And uh, you'll see that progress over the years, and it's going to happen very quickly as well. Um, so the, I mean, there's a solve for it too, right? It's not that it's all hopeless. And people mm-hmm. should, number one, adopt the technology and learn it and understand it and try to improve their skills as a result of what's coming and, and not be like, you know, having their heads in the sand, uh, mm-hmm. trying to let it pass by. Um, and secondly, one of the future options that's been mentioned is something like MBI, which is minimum basic income, mm-hmm. right? If truly these machines and these um, AIs are going to produce everything that needs to be produced, imagine from your software to your production lines, mm-hmm. to your medical offices, because doctors, what do they do? They diagnose, they look at patterns and they try to find uh, conclusions. And these machines can in some cases do better than the doctors themselves. So it's just a matter of time, right? Because so, they have all the algorithm and the data in their in their brain, I guess, or their yeah, like, data logs, so then they can look at all the f- they, symptoms, things, and give you a list of exactly what it is. They don't get tired. They don't <laughs> miss, right? So a doctor yeah. may see 50 things and miss one out of those 50, whereas the machine will not get tired in any one of those, right? Mm-hmm. And if it does, it'll learn from that one mistake and improve it next time and, and eliminate it. So the uh, the fact that there will be production, it's not like things aren't going to be produced, things are going to be consumed, so there will be wealth. But the question is, will people be willing to share that and let it spread to the society as a whole so that you have what you need to survive, and then you add value to yourself by upskilling to live a better lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So that might be one option that's been you know bandied yeah. about. That um, get the universal basic income is yeah. definitely something that me and my brother have been like talking mm-hmm. about for like four or five years, and uh, we followed a candidate named Andrew Yang for a yeah. really long time, and like right. he talked about it. He said, "Call it the Freedom Dividend, give a thousand dollars a month to every American citizen." And this was before COVID and everything. Right. And then me and my brother always laugh about it, We're like, dude, like. Think about what that really would do to people. Like, like people. So we were. He was like, I think, eighteen, nineteen at the time. I was twenty-one, and he, we were talking about like, dude, like a thousand a month. That would mean that I would be able to like invest in myself because a thousand a month doesn't mean like I'm balling. You know, mm-hmm. you're not living lavish right. even then. Even now, for sure, you're just not doing mm-hmm. anything really. But it at least meets your basic phys- physiological needs, right? Mm-hmm. Where I can 
pay for at least food, water, maybe shelter. If I split it with a couple people, communal mm-hmm. living. Okay, cool. But then where does that money realistically go? It goes back into your communities. Like you're saying, if everyone gets $1,000 a month, then if I want to sign up my son into uh, little league signups, right? That $50, $100, $150 goes back into the community to pay the coach. That's going to coach and volunteer his time. Okay, cool. That's going to go here, here. So that $1,000 mm-hmm. isn't it's not like it's, again, you're going to quit your job and never going to stop working. But it just a supplement to that, and that money goes back into the economy. And like he broke it down, like all the math mm-hmm. and like how you would do it, and how it would actually like boost the economy. And I was thinking, all the test trials that they've done, it's worked. But they don't want it because they want people to be in that, like you said, like the rat race, the struggle, the grind, to keep them trapped almost because you don't want people to ascend higher almost because they want to have that control, that chokehold. And it's hard to see, like you're saying, the polarization where it's like it's either one or the other. And then they'll say they'll just sit there and argue about it for 10 hours, do filibusters, do all these mm-hmm. things, but never actually get anything done. But they're the ones making millions of dollars yeah. in the stock market. So well, then it's like, yeah, there's different ways to look at it, right? You can yeah. look at it and I don't call it conspiracy theories to say that they're trying to force people to stay in that path. Mm-hmm. But the reality is the capitalist engine that's been designed yeah. for the world is built for that. Yeah, because and, and think about this. What's the difference between capitalism as we know it today and Islamic economics and financing? Mm-hmm. Take out the interest in all those things to the side. Yeah. The difference is morals and values. Yeah. Because Islam encourages capitalism as well. You mm-hmm. can go and be as wealthy as you want as a Muslim, mm-hmm. but recognize that a part of your wealth is not yours. You have to purify it and make sure it gets to the people who need it. Number two in the Quran, Allah tells us very clearly, why do we give charity? Kayla yakuna so that this wealth does not become the wording a beautiful wording does not become something that circulates amongst the wealthy of you mm-hmm. right something that circulates so literally the word talks about and that's exactly what capitalism does in the world it corrupts so that where is the wealth it's with the wealthy the rich get richer and how do they circulate it they, they buy art <laughs> which is meaningless <laughs> to everybody right and that circulates they buy cars they buy yachts they buy all these things that circulate and circulate amongst them Mm-hmm. They never get. And they it sell down. it to one another. Like, who's if I sell a property for sixty million, who's buying it for seventy million? Not, not the. It circulates. It all circulates. So we're being told, don't let this become something that circulates within the rich. It's meant for everybody. Mm-hmm. So let it get down to those who need it, either through charity or through spending it in the right ways to get that done. So if we look at that perspective and say the the capitalist engine that's built and designed for the world is made without morals, mm-hmm. it's agnostic to those kinds of values. So. What's the number one reason people want to make money in a capitalist world? Shareholder value. Whoever the sh- If it's one person owning it or a corporation that's public, shareholder value is what you always hear. Mm-hmm. And what does that come at the expense of? It, it comes at the expense of someone, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's the workers who get paid the minimum amount. The labor, who, yeah. Right? Who do all, a lot of the hard work and they get the minimum amount. Or, um, you know, whoever's in the middle or, or in between all those chains all the way up to the top, right? So that's just how it's designed. And yes, uh, the people who are in the positions who have the most want to keep that design as intact as possible because it benefits them, right? Because that's their value. Um, but there are people who are trying to fight against that and say, you know what, maybe this should be uh, a different type of system that allows those people up on top to stay up on top but not have as much of the pie as, uh, as they have right now mm-hmm. and then share that amongst others in one way or the other. And again, the ultimate beneficiary, who is that going to be? Because if we have a society full of people who are made redundant because of AI and other systems, then who is that burden going to fall on? The government and in some way taxes and so on and so forth. It all goes around, right? So um, you know, I, I hope that humanity comes to its senses at some point and recognizes the importance of morals and values, which on a personal level in societies have been diminished you know, over the past few decades especially. I mean, I've lived long enough to see the fact that when I was growing up, I would watch TV shows about life here in this country where people interacted in a particular way, the men and women interacted in a particular way, the values of, of modesty were different, the values of, of economics were different, society was very different. And then it progressed rapidly over the past few decades into one that is almost devoid of those morals and values and mm-hmm. replaced by values that are more worldly and capitalistic that uh, can be negative and can mm-hmm. be destructive unless they're used appropriately. So yeah. we just need people to get back to that and think about that and reflect. And how do you do that? You know, faith. Faith is what brings you yeah. back. No, I love the answer too. And thank you again for the wisdom on that as well. Because you obviously you understand like and seeing it with your own eyes, you're like, I see it happening and it's been happening before. Like you said, it's very cyclical. So like we see like the trends that kind of like conspire against us in a way where it's like, 
we were just kind of dealt with this the, these cards. Okay, now solve the problem. And it's tough because again, again, being twenty five and like seeing it from like even from when I was fifteen versus twenty five. Like I remember being in high school, everyone's like, "What's Bitcoin?" We're talking about Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. and now it's this big giant crazy that everyone's talking about now, and like investing in it so heavily. But we were all talking about it when it was under a thousand in high school. Like, well, what is this? Huh? What is this new stuff? But we don't have the actual capital to do anything. So then you start realizing like, what are the trends and where is the world going with technology? All these different things. That's why like so many kids will be like, "Oh, like I use a computer and computer." has this chip in it and i use computers all the time but then 20 years ago people were like oh computers yeah it's cool and all blah blah blah. they're great technology but then now we have actual like machine computers in our hands that are our phones right so it's like how fast technology can just adapt so quickly and kind of going off that like i just want to thank you again for like sharing it even about like the islamic business sense as well where it's like the morals and values i was just talking to my dad about this and he was saying like at the end of the day like when it comes down to like anything that happens in America where it's like, oh, there's misogyny or there's this or any political things or any issue that happens. He was like, the reason as to why like these exist or when people fail is because they're not having that like, Islamic moral values or even any morals and values or in their culture, their society. And when you don't have that, that's the issue. It's like people will steal. Okay, the people steal. But if they were taught not to steal and stealing is wrong and it's so shameful upon the community to do this thing, then less people will do it regardless. Mm-hmm. Again, having that like cultural stigma of not doing it. The same way like 50, 60, 70 years ago, people like we were, were cursing at people saying the N-word to one another. And it was like normal. And, like, oh, you use this uh, water fountain, not this water fountain. But nowadays if that happened, the cultural stigma is like absolutely not. Whether you're white, black, Asian, doesn't matter. Everyone's saying absolutely not. But then how do you make that the cultural stigma for those morals and values again? Yeah. You know, I think that's again like a pretty cool kind of conceptualized thinking. To like, yeah, it's it's hard because that's you have to find um, both the reasons for why things are happening and also find a path to a solution as well. And some of it is really simple: go back to the values that were there. Mm-hmm. And because I I do some interfaith work, and people ask about you know the way women dress in Islam, for example, and they cover themselves in a particular way. And I tell them, growing up, I watched a Little House on the Prairie on TV. Growing up in a, in a Muslim country, yeah, and um, you know the women in that show all covered up before going into town to meet uh, people that were not <laughs> their husbands, <laughs> yeah, right. And that was just the norm of this country, of, of this society, not long ago. And somewhere along the way, those values got lost. And that's just one example, right? Even dealing with people stealing, like you said, or or cheating, and all of that, it was a different moral sense. Even raising children was not a individual family responsibility everybody in the neighborhood helped out even mm-hmm. in this country right mm-hmm. and now nobody cares about their own kids let alone other people's kids right mm-hmm. so um we just need to find that connection back to these values that existed and, and where did those values come from they didn't just come out of thin air right mm-hmm. every one of those go- goes back to some faith system and tradition from its core roots mm-hmm. not what it's become today and what's being taught today but its core roots yeah and if people went back to that it would be a completely different world that we'd be in yeah, no, I love that too because it's cool because when I learned like what hijab is, like for example, men have a hijab of like the covering up themselves as well mm-hmm. where it's not like it's like wearing high short shorts or mm-hmm. wearing cutoffs all the time. And this is like there's some sort of ghira of yourself as well where you're not supposed to show off yourself as well. Okay. And it was interesting because I realized that it kind of also shows that they had like a colorization photo. I always talk about this, but like they always have like a, they had like an image of like the 1950s in America, New York. It's like Paul walking. And as everyone's walking, you're looking, you're like, 90% of these women are basically wearing a hijab, mm-hmm. you know, and hijab just means like, again, just wearing modest clothes mm-hmm. and they're covered up and like the hair is like the least of it. It's like, but then they would still wear like shawls almost or like, right. you know, and they Scarves, still had, yeah. right? And all these things. So it kind of made me chuckle. I'm like, that's not even that long ago, mm-hmm. you know? And then it, you kind of laugh about it because you're thinking, they say that it's oppression or, oh, they're oppressed to wear. It's like, they're choosing to wear that, you know? So then it's, you have that other conversation in your head where it's like, and if anything, it's protecting the woman's beauty because again, it's like, it's like, Everyone knows, like, that's, like, the diamond. You know, it's, like, you, your beauty is, like, that diamond. So, it's, like, protecting it is because there's so much value in you, not just because it's not, you know. So, it's, like, it's weird that now it's so misconstrued in the society, but then it only harms, like, us as a society when we don't go back to, again, morals and values of just togetherness. Like you said, the community thing. I think that's a really good point, too, because, like, 
how often now where it's like if some some person's dad or mom told me what to do when I'm walking, I'm like, what are you saying? Like, don't tell me what to do. You're not my mom. You're not my dad. You're not my, my mom. My dad doesn't tell me what to do. <laughs> Who are you to tell me what to do? And you see that in, the, in like in the society where people like will like say things to their parents. I'm like, you tell your mom that? Like, I'm like, I'm like, yo, if I said that, like. <laughs> that's not that's not how it would happen for me if i said the same words you know so yeah even at this age <laughs> exactly exactly even at this age so you kind of laugh at it but like it's true you're right you know what i mean it's like we're, we're right like you know it's it, it does take a community like making sure like everyone's safe everyone's healthy like if i fell and scabbed my knee that if my mom or my dad's not right there mm-hmm. that if a mom and dad saw me fall they'd help me give me a band-aid mm-hmm. and when i was younger i remember things like that did happen oh like i'm waiting at soccer practice and my dad's like busy work and like i'll just walk home and like a mom was like no you're not gonna walk home she'd pick me up and drive me home mm-hmm. she's like you're not about to walk home like i'm like it's like a mile and a half away you're 12 13 years old <laughs> no so and the thing is like it was so genuine and nice but again it's that community aspect like you're kind of going back into right and that's amazing you say that just because um sometimes we don't recognize some of these blessings and gifts that we have just by the circumstances of our birth and where we are and the values that we've been born with and, and live with even though we might not like them when we're growing up but people who are going back to the earlier part of this conversation who accept Islam and are new to it, that's something they recognize very quickly. Mm-hmm. That the fact they come into a mosque that's full of people and they're able to stand um, pretty much shoulder to shoulder with strangers they've never met before and feel the sense of peace and comfort and belonging that they can't get anywhere else. Right? That they know that, hey, you know what, regardless of what happens, these people around me, they've got my back. Mm-hmm. Even though they have no, they don't know my name. They don't know who I am, where I come from. I know that if I need help, they're all going to be there to help me and support me. And and we're losing that as a society. Mm-hmm. And so the, the fact that you're recognizing and appreciating it, I think it's a good thing. And and we need to do that and be grateful for it because yeah. sometimes we get taught those lessons by people who are new to the faith rather than being grateful for it all the time. No, of course, and mm. I love that insight. Mm. And I wanted to ask you, um, what's something that most people probably don't know about you? I know you answered it with saying like you grew up in like you said you grew up in like a Muslim country, mm. but but you went to a Catholic school. Yeah, so I went. I grew up in um, a Muslim country in the Middle East. Uh, my family is originally from Pakistan, but I grew up in Bahrain uh, in the Middle East. Mm. And uh, my entire schooling was at a Catholic church. It was actually not just a church; it was a convent run by Italian nuns, and it was a mission. In a Muslim country. So they came there to preach their faith. And uh, they had morals and values. And my ears are a testament to that because they kept twisting them every time <laughs> I did something wrong. Or they're like, go clean up that mess on the ground regardless of who threw it. Go clean it up because mm-hmm. that's what we do. So, um, yeah, it was a transformational experience for me you know, growing up in that environment. To And I didn't connect it to my own faith. I mean, I, I could very easily have. I just saw these as faithful women who were running this uh, institution where they were not just providing spiritual growth for individuals. I mean, obviously, they were very respectful of uh, the Muslims who were there, and they didn't try to preach or, or push the religion on us. But we saw the values everywhere. Um, but the fact that they turned us into moral human beings as well, and mm-hmm. that was something quite um, positive in, my, in my, my personal experience and something that everyone should go through in one way or the other, not that they have to go get their ears pulled, but, <laughs> but just to be part of a culture that's different and um, maybe even contradictory to your own, just to get that respect and recognition that there are people who are different in in the world. And um, even though we may not see eye to eye on the cores of of faith, we can still live together as human beings and and be good for society. No, I love that. Again, love that answer. And it's very interesting because, again, it's like to be like a Muslim in that society. It's like even for me, like I was telling you earlier, like going up Muslim in like my school or classrooms or university, all these different things, everyone's like, probably one of the only Muslims and everyone's like oh you're praying what's that oh, what's this you believe in Allah not God oh what's it like having to answer the questions so it's interesting that like you grew up in a place where like you went to school literally in a place where they're teaching again like not forcing it upon you but they're like way, their way of life is way different but it's so cool again like there's always been respect and that's something similar as well for me in my life it's People would ask me respectfully, and I'd answer them respectfully, and I'd we would never like argued or yelled or screamed because like what's the point? It's supposed to be knowledge and learning, and like you said, the morals and values. Yeah. So again, I love that. No, that that reminds me actually of a story when I was in college. Um, I had this guy in the in our dorm who um, was very openly racist, but not in a bad way. And I don't want, want this to sound wrong, right? <laughs> it was his worldview that his race was the top. And not that he didn't have friends who were different races or he could relate to them. He could. He was a very nice guy in general. But he's like, at the end of the day, you know, we're at the top. So he spent uh, um, six months on an overseas uh, trip 
to in the UK. Mm-hmm. And he came back a completely changed person. He goes, man, I thought that we were it. Like, you know, uh, my race is it. <laughs> we mm-hmm. were the ones. And then I went there. I saw people who were from all these different colors and backgrounds. And they were more smarter than me. Mm-hmm. They could speak better English than me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, they were like good people. Mm-hmm. It's like, I just realized we're not it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, so that was a wake up call for him. And that interaction between different peoples and cultures um, is so important to shape our worldview and our, our philosophy on how we go about this life. Because we only have a finite amount of time and we have to make the most of it, not just for ourselves, for, but for the betterment of society as well. Mm-hmm. And I again, love that because even when I studied abroad in England as well for like five, six months, mm-hmm. like when I went there, a lot of the times, a lot of the, like, the main things that I learned really were things like, wow, like we all are so different, so similar at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yet, like we all have different cultures, cuisines, foods, all these different things, but at the end of the day, we all still share a meal together. We'll do this together. There's different flavors and styles, but you know, the meal still brings us all together. Maybe there's different jokes and things, but laughter is universal. Mm-hmm. So it's like it kind of showed me. And obviously, being Egyptian, like being immigrated from Egypt, living in Brooklyn, and living here, and like moving around. So I always had that cultureness to me. But living it and going somewhere different alone, and like kind of experiencing that alone, and going to Italy, France, and a small little island, and then going to Spain, and going here. It's like you see all the different walks of life and how. Mm-hmm. People live here. This is people's day to day. But I'm here just for the week. Oh, but this is how people eat. This is their thought, their food, their style, their vibes, the air they be, they breathe. Mm-hmm. So it's again like such an amazing experience. And I want to kind of tie this into asking you what's like an unpopular opinion you have. <laughs> my unpopular opinion of choice mm-hmm. <laughs> is that I like uh, mayo with my fries. I mean, uh, I spent uh, actually there's a backstory to that as well. I spent six months um, in Holland. Mm-hmm. In the late '90s, probably before you were born. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, at that time, that's what they do there, right? They they don't have ketchup with their fries; they have mayonnaise, mm-hmm. and it's called uh, fritz met, you know, fries with, mm-hmm. and that always automatically means with with uh, mayo. You have mm-hmm. to buy ketchup, right? Yeah. Mayo is free. Um, so I, I acquired the taste of that. And since then, I haven't looked back. And uh, yeah, it's uh, mayo or bust when yeah. it comes to fries. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so. That's interesting because even for me, like, I actually don't like ketchup that much. Like, mm. I've never liked ketchup that much. When I was younger, like, maybe barbecue sauce I liked a little more. But even now, like, I like more of, like, a spicy sauce or a sriracha or something like that. But for me, like, genuinely, like, ketchup was never, like, my go-to ever. So right. it's funny you had, when you said that, I kind of laughed. I read it, I laughed. Yeah. I was like, you know what, like, mayonnaise is good. You know what I mean? It's like, and I know people do, like, QP mayo, which is, like, a mix of mayo plus something. Right? Right, it's like right. mayo and barbecue sauce, mayo and ketchup. Yeah, yeah. But, like, is I mean, hey, that's the reason why people put on burgers, chicken burgers, all, all right. things, because it has that, like, like a creamy consistency mm-hmm. of sauce and stuff, too. So oh, it's different. So I hope your comments don't blow up as a result of that. But, uh, <laughs> that's my unpopular opinion. No, <laughs> I got you. That's awesome. Yeah. And one of the last things I always ask is, like, what's your one of your favorite quotes? Mm-hmm. And you said that there is no gift greater than patience. Mm-hmm. So I kind of wanted you to elaborate on your favorite quote. Whew, all right. How do I do that without getting too personal? Right. Um, yeah, I guess I'll be straight up about that. Right. That's something that... Um, there's people who are almost born patient, right? You can see that their demeanor is just like, oh, they're just so chill and relaxed and it's amazing, right? And there's people who um, have to acquire it over the years through experience. And then there's the, there are those who struggle through it for the entirety of their lives because it's just not natural to them. I, I, as we talked about earlier, every human being is born different with different capacities and tendencies. And uh, patience is one of those core values that uh, you know is important to us as, as human beings and is, a, I believe, a work in progress for our entire lives. So I'm on the latter side of that category. I was not born this way, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I am there yet uh, right now either, but it's something that I've learned through experience to recognize is that the only way to truly be successful is to have that patience and think of the long-term prospects of anything, not to get caught up in the moment. And this is not these aren't my own findings, right? This is what our faith teaches us, mm-hmm. that when... And this is what uh, our Quran says as well, which is that when good things happen, again, paraphrasing, that's what's written for you. So don't get too excited about them. Mm-hmm. And when bad things happen, don't get too depressed and upset about them. It was written for you, right? There's something there and reason that you'll find out in the future about why that happened. But if you can't figure it out right then, don't worry. Just move on. So that level of patience is very hard uh, for me personally. So it's been a, a journey over a couple of decades to try and, number one, recognize how important patience is in my life, and number two, work on it every single day 
to be able to implement that and apply it to myself. Mm-hmm. And it's still hard, it's not easy, but it's uh, something I'm willing to take on as a challenge. And I personally have seen the results of it. I really believe that it is a gift. It's not something that I can say I earned and I it's, I deserve it. It's something that's been bestowed upon me. And I know people who well, maybe were similar to me many years ago who didn't make an effort towards it and they haven't changed their ways in, in how they are. And you can see the results of that as well, right? And so uh, I really am enamored by this concept of patience and I have been for a while and I try to use it in every aspect of my life my personal my professional family wherever else I can I can use it um, because I think that is the true salvation for us is to be patient with whatever happens good or bad and at the same time patiently work and persevere on that path that is straight but hard to stay on and if we do that then we'll be successful and if we don't and we lose that patience then you know bad things can happen Mm-hmm. No, again, I love the quote and love the answer to it because even someone, again, being a young guy in this mm-hmm. day and age where everything's so accessible, right? The phone, I can click any button, boom, this pops up, this pops up, this pops up. Okay, I want it now, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Things can come to your front door in two days if you order it online, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a sense of everything comes so fast now for our generation. So almost like patience is now becoming even more of a virtue, even more of a skill that's so hard to maintain. And even in like business life or life or all these things like, oh, I don't know why this happened. Or I don't know why this happened. Or oh, so much delay. And like, why is this getting delayed again, again, again? And I remember I read this somewhere in that uh, there's like khir. So like mm-hmm. that khir is like the word. And it's like it's delay. Like there's there's goodness in delay. So I kind of don't know, I don't know. I don't know if you know anything about that as well, or I'm I'm probably paraphrasing as well. But I don't know if one. I'm not sure about that specific example. I know khair just means good, mm-hmm. and uh, for us, well, we know that when we ask for good, it can come immediately, it can mm-hmm. be delayed, and it can be kept away from us. And that is really the true patience for us. For us to recognize that there may be d- delayed gratification, but that may be better for us than getting exactly what we want in terms of good. Because if I am really desiring something with all my heart and I try really hard to get it, and I don't get it, and I'm patient with that and say, you know what, it wasn't meant to be, then the value of whatever it is I was trying to achieve will be kept and invested for me, and that investment will grow and grow and grow, and I, God willing, will see it at a later point in time, on the day of reckoning and beyond, and I'll be more grateful for that investment growing all that time Mm -hmm. rather than getting it right there on the spot and enjoying it for a little bit. Mm-hmm. So if, if that's the perspective I need to have to really implement patience, then I'm trying really hard to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> trying. It's not automatic. <laughs> no, again, like I lo- love that. And I just want to thank you again for coming mm-hmm. on the Oli Kamali Show mm-hmm. and like, being here and sharing this moment with me as well. So again, great like conversation, wisdom, and be able to like, I guess also give a little bit of your insight about life. Because again, for someone like me, looking up someone in my community and stuff that kind of has always been there. It's like mm-hmm. have, actually having that conversation saying, hey, like, what are some little things and advice? Because I'm someone who needs a little bit of, like, some of the stuff there I was asking just for me personally. Mm-hmm. I always some other things as well where it's like, hey, like, as a new Muslim, what to do and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I just want to thank you again for having on to the podcast. I appreciate the invitation and I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Yeah, inshallah. Take care. So thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode of the Oli Canoli Show. Again, said he had Brother Rizwan. And again, it was an awesome conversation. And he's such an like, intelligent man. And great to hear so much of his opinions and his wisdom behind so many different situations. But if you guys want to be sitting in the same seat he's sitting in as well, in the description below, there'll be the form. Please feel free to apply. I'd love to learn about you and talk to you as well. Thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode. And I'll see you guys next time.